Spencer Reynolds is an artist I met at the U.S. Open of Surfing in Huntington Beach, California, roughly 10 years ago. His art struck me by way of its trippy, surrealist approach to landscapes and ocean scenes. This conversation certainly took some turns I didn't expect, including his time working in the wakeboarding industry, as well as some time spent chatting about his meditation practice and overall things in conjunction with mental health. I can't thank Spencer enough for his candor, and without further ado, let's jump into the episode. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. How are you? Good, good. I don't have uh, the nice mic and stuff. No worries. I um, The sound seems to be just fine, so that's it's all good. I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, it's so funny. I was thinking, again, I think we had this conversation when I saw you back in July, but I was like, did we ever figure out what year we met? <laughs> was it 2014? Did I meet you at the U.S. Open? Yeah, it was the U.S. Open in Huntington Beach. And I want to say it was like 2012, maybe 2014. It was the year of the riot, the last riot. I don't know that I had the gallery at that time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. It, this was pre your store because I remember later hearing about you and we'll get into that for sure. Um, anyway, the year is kind of irrelevant. I think it's been 10 plus years, I guess is my point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause I mean, the store is, the store will be eight, uh, this December. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, call it, call it 10 years ago. Yeah. Probably 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So how long had you been painting then, like professionally? Um, I I started when I was, um, well, professionally, I would say since about, um, well, I mean, I, my professional career started in, in about 96. Oh, wow. I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily making a living at um, painting at that point. Okay. I I had been um I had been working for like children's educational video game companies in Seattle and um and then af I did that for um a few years with a couple different companies and then um one of the one of the tech guys at the those companies had a connection at Hyperlight Wakeboards and so he introduced me to the guys at Hyperlite. So then I started doing wakeboard designs. No way. Yeah, yeah. So and then so so I were I did a lot of wakeboards for uh, many years in the late nineties. Okay. So all right, this is this is funny because I had no idea. Um, are you familiar with who Mike Weddington is? Mm. -mm. He was the 95 world champ of wakeboarding. He's a good friend of mine. And oh, cool. uh, he's actually been on this podcast. <laughs> oh, no and, way. Yeah. So he rode, I'm trying to think the last company he rode for was Origin, which was sort of late 90s, maybe even early 2000s. But I cannot for the life of me remember who his sponsor was for boards in 95 when he won. Full Tilt, I think, was. Okay. Full tilt I don't really know much about wakeboarding, actually. Oh, that's funny, because I was going to ask you, like, were you working directly with the riders on their graphics, or was it just, like, not their pro models? It was just kind of like the off-the-shelf stuff. I did do some pro models. I did... Um, Scott Byerly? I feel like I did a Scott Byerly. I, 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 I'm not positive. I I kind of feel like I did a Scott Barley, but I'm not, I'm not positive. It's, it's so funny. Cause it's, it's just a world. I'm not too, I, I like, I know the name Scott Barley and I don't remember if it's, I know it because I, I did one of his boards have my graphics or I was just sort of paying attention to the wakeboard scene at that time. That's so funny. But just buying the magazines and then kind of flipping through and look at the, the names, but I just didn't have any, uh, no connection to, I, I, you know, I've barely been behind a boat. Right. <laughs> so I, d I wakeboarded in high school behind, I have a very dear friend of mine, Steven. Actually, Steven's the guy that I, who lives in Oregon. That's who I went to see. Okay. And so he and I grew up together and his family had a lake house 
north of Raleigh, North Carolina, where I grew up. And that's where Mike lived. He lived on Lake Gaston. And we used to wakeboard on Lake Gaston all the time. And that's how I got to know him and another buddy of mine, Adam Fields. Shout out, Adam. I doubt you're hearing this, but uh, he's uh, another pro wakeboard guy. You've done, you've been a, you've been a wakeboarder. I mean, you've, you've spent a lot of time wakeboarding. I, I, I did, yeah, in high school for sure, and a little bit in college. I haven't wakeboarded in years. I miss it. I, I used to love wakeboarding, but I just, you know. Yeah. Here it's, you, you surf instead. Like, there are no lakes with, like, buttery, smooth water. So, um, yeah, that's funny, but yeah. Yeah, I always wanted to try the uh, wake surfing. Uh, I, thought, I always thought that looked fun. That's the rage now. Yeah, it looks really fun. Yeah. And, and uh, we would, my family would do an annual trip to Lake Shasta and we would rent like um, just a, a little boat w that didn't throw much of a wake. And I would like to stand up bodyboard on it. That was kind yeah. of my, and I would do spins and, uh, you know, just act like I was surfing and then hit the lip and slide the tail out stuff. Yeah. It was the uh, standing up on the knee board was like the genesis of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's we would always stand up on the kneeboard. Blast from the past. And I had no idea about you working for Hyperlight. That's crazy. Were they based in Seattle? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, so it's HO and mm -hmm. Hyperlight. And then there's, there's a wakeboard company called Joby, right? Uh, well, they were a ski company, but yes. Yeah, I think they probably make wakeboards as well. But huge ski company, I remember. I think... So I know HO Hyperlight is one company. Joby may have been, um, cause they did have some wakeboards for a little bit. I think there was crossover and some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, Joby Hyperlight may have made, I think what Hyperlight did is they made Joby's wakeboards. Yeah. You see that a lot in the snowboarding industry as well. Like, you know, certain factories making multiple brands, boards and such. And, um, surfing as well for that matter i think like now that surfboards are you know cnc'd and stuff a lot of people are are, are making a bunch of different boards you know for yeah. multiple shapers uh but um yeah that's really interesting okay so what what was like the vibe back then like on your own stuff were, were you being told what to design for hyperlight were they giving you creative direction or was it like hey go nuts um they had they definitely told me to go nuts on a few cool sometimes i mean they were i was getting paid so little they were just like <laughs> you know th th they were just like yeah do whatever you want man and we'll just you know buy it for not you know 300 bucks per design it was like it, you know it was right. i mean i remember the first time i got money from them it was um was his name herb o'brien um he just paid me cash out of his pocket <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah so were you doing your own thing on the side then? Like, like you're doing now kind of painting? A little and... bit. Yeah. A little bit. Not, not as much. Um, I, I, yeah. And, and, and in regards to, um, they, they would give me, um, free reign a lot, but then they did, they did have me do, they had a kneeboard called the Joker and I, I did artwork for that a few times and then they would, they liked it so much they'd re republish or i don't know what you make another edition of kneeboards with the same graphics and then and then i also they had a uh um series called the voyager and mm -hmm. it was like a kid's board and that was really fun i really liked because i just met i reimagined these characters in the in the little world i create like this sort of like one of them was a sort of an undersea like gerbil maze almost you know of okay connecting orbs and things and um it, it was pretty fun i i and one was like a blade runner type city but nothing is like my art back then was not nearly as good as it is now so some okay. of the stuff like the reason i don't show some of that stuff is because i don't necessarily like some of that stuff i think right I, i've gotten a lot better over the years well, I think it's kind of like songwriting, right? Like your earliest songs that like an artist would write, they're like, oh my God, that's just so awful. Like the structure's bad or like, I can't believe I rhymed those two words or, you know, like whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we, even, even for me, for standard age, I'm just like, I look back on some of the t-shirts I was producing in, you know, 2016 and I was like, 
I'm so glad I'm not doing that now, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> things like that. Um, which is just kind of funny to think about, but, um, was, so was painting always something you were doing as a kid or like, were you just always sketching or into art? Like where, where did you go to college? Was it in Seattle or? Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up here in Brookings, Oregon and, um, I, I had drawn my whole life. Uh, what got me into drawing initially was, um, I think I, I mean, prior to this, you know, like you'd always draw on your like little war scenes on your peaches of this, you know, these people fighting each other and everything. But, but then eventually like once, once I was in middle school, the, the, um, the TNC surf designs t-shirts with all the characters, like through the gorilla and Joe cool yeah. and wave wars and all that, they became popular. I loved them. I kind of made my own version of them and, um, that, so I, I did that for many years, just, just little doodles somewhere. I think I still have those doodles around somewhere. Cool. And then, um, and then in high school, I got fascinated with airbrushing. And, um, so I spent many years airbrushing and then I went to art school in Seattle. Um, well, I went to a community college first, then I went to art school. But, um, uh, when I got to art school, I, I ditched, I kind of, I, I, I got into painting and ditched, um, Air airbrushing brushing. because yeah. airbrushing was so much work with stencils and I wanted to actually move paint, you know, like airbrushing. It was like, you spent, spent all this time, like cutting out all these little pieces and stuff. And then, and then you spend five minutes like, ch -ch -ch -ch, you know, and, and I didn't like, um, the ratio of, of, uh, putting paint down to all the work that goes into that. So, um, yeah, I got into painting around 19 and I've, and I've always done it. Um, I took, a, yeah, I, this, I went to the Art Institute of Seattle. I was an associate's degree. I got an associate's degree from there. It wasn't, uh, there were some good teachers, wasn't like the greatest education, but I, after school, I had met, um, there was a guy there that taught figure drawing named Henry Stenson. And, um, after after I graduated and I was working for a children's video game company, I had the money to take classes from him, and he was he specialized in Russian impressionism. Oh, wow. So um, I was doing a lot of studio painting and plein air painting at that time, and um, not good at it, but loved it. And uh, you know, I think it's I think some of those roots are stuff that I still want to pursue to this day. Like I want to do more plain air painting. I just, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to, with the gallery and commissions and, and all the things that I have to do for the business, it's hard for me to find time to get out doors and just paint. So I started getting back into that this summer and it felt really good. And I don't think the results I'm, I, I'm, uh, that I'm having right now are the best, but, um, you know, you just time and practice, you'll, you'll get better. And that's, that's what I, I just, I always, I just follow what I love and that, um, it feels like just something I'm at the point with my art where if I just pursue something, um, uh, I, I kind of know how, I think I know how to, um, fit it into my repertoire. Sure. So it's just more instinctual now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just that's following cool. my passions and stuff. I mean so here's a stupid question. You said plain air painting. Is that what you said? Uh -huh. What does that mean? Painting outdoors. Oh, okay. Not, like murals or? No, just painting on location. So you you set up. Oh, I see. A little, a right. An easel. easel. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you just paint what you see. It's hard because, I mean, it's hard for me because see, I'm a, I'm a kind of slow studio painter. And what I like about it is you got to get, you, you don't have a lot of time to think. You just have to like put information down and move on, keep moving, you know, cause the, the web, everything's changing all the time, it, particularly sure. in the Northwest clouds are rolling in fogs rolling in. So you're, you just have to get down the information as quick as possible. So you don't, you know, and I wouldn't say my instincts in it yet are that good, but, um, you know, it's just with practice. I mean, I know how to paint, so it's like with practice, I'll, I'll figure out how to, um, do it better and, in conjunction with that, I, I've from time to time now I'm doing live painting with a band, 
And that's, you know, there's one band in town that I've been kind of doing it with. Um, there's another guy that I'm going to do. We're both turning 50 this year. So we're going to do, um, he's going to play music and I'm going to paint. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So that'll be fun. But it's, you know, it, uh, the guys that I was painting with, their set was two hours. So I knew I had two hours to come up with something. And so at first I was just totally improvising. And then eventually I sort of made a little bit of a, I made a really loose plan. And then I would just try to get as much information down as I could in the two hours. Nothing I've done, I would call a finished product, but the goal was basically just to entertain and show nothing to something in two sure. hours. So would you sell that piece at the end of the two hours or would you go and finish it in your studio and then sell it? I've been uh, finishing them in my studios because I I've, I've had offers. People want to give me money because um, they want it on the cheap. But I I just I, I and I, you know, it's it's fun. They're in, you know, they've been been drinking, having fun and they're just like, I love it. I want it. But I sure I, you know, I I just always see it as this diamond in the rough that I need to. I need to sort of refine and maybe, maybe you could just like at the end when they're drunk, take a 50% deposit and say, look, like that's fine. You're just half down now and come and see me in two weeks when it's done. Or, you know, <laughs> I always get nervous about the 50% thing. Like I'm, I'm doing a commission right now, this painting behind me and, oh, cool. uh, and uh, the lady's been waiting for, I mean, I, it's very nice that she's been waiting for, like, she's been waiting over a year or more, but. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, uh, I just get nervous about, I commissions, I try not to do them. Um, and I don't really have to do them with the gallery I have, but, but they, um, people bother me a lot for not bother me, but they, they want them often request them. <laughs> yeah. And I get nervous about their expectations meeting what will come out of me. I don't a hundred percent. I don't, well, not, not even close to hundred percent. I don't control what comes out of me. I feel, I feel, and I think people always have an idea of who I am and what I'll paint. And I don't even know what that is. So right. it's, that's why a commission is uh, kind of a tricky thing for me. If it's a person that is, I can tell the parameters on their expectations is really loose. I'm, I'm totally into it. But into if, that, if yeah. they're like, if they're going to micromanage me, not going to work. Cause that's, it's just not how the creativity works. Well, it's funny. I had a question written down for later that was kind of like, do you ever feel pressure to create? And I guess this would probably be the primary instance where you would feel that pressure. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I, if not the only instance, maybe. Yeah. I mostly don't feel pressure to create. It's, it's a joy to create. Um, the, the only time, like the times I feel real pressure is those self-inflicted ones like plein air painting or live painting. And in those situations, you just have to press through whatever you're feeling and paint and you know because i i'm sort of a wallflower i'm not a person that wants to be in front of people so um uh live painting makes me really nervous but i try to channel that energy into the into the piece you know right. it's i think it's kind of a healthy mental exercise to try to take you know channel what could be negative energy into something creative and positive sure um when did you feel like you could survive on your art? Like when did, like when was there a moment that you felt like painting professionally could support you? Like, what was that like moment? Like, I think maybe five years ago. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So had you been working other jobs as well? No, no. I just, <laughs> uh, I, you know, um, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I think it was, I think it was when the gallery really, I felt like was going to go somewhere. Um, cause I had before the gallery, I had traveled a lot for shows and, um, it was always hit and miss. I mean, I could have a great show or I could have, I could, I could have a show where I didn't even pay 
back the amount that it took me to go to the show. So sure. Yeah, I, I identify with that. But I just chalk that up to like marketing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's I know. I, and I've gotten better at, at taking that um, approach to it. But it's still kind of, um, man, when you need money, uh, it's it's <laughs> it's hard to like, you know, it's hard to just say, well, I didn't make any money at that. So, so right. the gallery has been really nice to the gallery has been this place where, um, I can make it like I want it. And, and there's been great local support as well as like tourist support. And, you know, there's people that come to the, come to Brookings for their annual vacation. And one of the things they do is come to the shop. And that means a lot. That means so much to me that, that I, my art and creativity has touched people like that. That's great. What were some of those like primary markets and like things that you were doing? I mean, other than the U S open, obviously. Um, it was, it would be, um, galleries, shops and outdoor markets, basically. Mostly local or like how far, or how, how, how far were you traveling? I went all the way to La Jolla on one that bombed. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long drive. I've just done it. <laughs> It was brutal, man. And they even like kind of fe the, the event even kind of featured me as like they were impressed with my art. So they featured me as um, like one of their featured artists. And then I got there and there was I mean, I'm not, you know, and it's an outdoor event and people have down at this one, they had these elaborate setups that were like two booths, you know, and these booths are supposed to be 10 by 10. They had, you know, this is like a 10 by 20 and then it's like 20 feet high, you know, you know what I mean? It was like these wow. crazy and I have a 10 by 10 tent. That's the, and it, and that's what I've got. Right. And it just did, it did, you know, and they're, they're pulling up in sprinter vans with trailers and stuff. I pulled up in my Honda element, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh yeah, this isn't, uh, uh, you know, and I just, I didn't make back my, I don't think I made back my entry money on that one. Wow. Let alone the gas and the food and the, yeah. Know. Yeah. No, wow. I had some like, uh, like early on there's, it's brutal sometimes, but I just, I think I was just dumb enough to keep going forward. <laughs> right. Right. Sometimes. Yeah, exactly. I, it was I, like a can, blind I can, I, yeah, I can identify with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So if you're not doing what live air painting, right. Is what you said. Uh, planar. Or planar. Sorry. Um, I guess you're painting from a photograph, I guess, mostly, or just from memory or I go between, I go between like, uh, yeah, a lot of times I'm painting, painting from a photograph and sometimes I'm just painting from my own mind. Right. But at, even if I'm painting from a photograph, there's a certain point where the painting has to stand apart from the photograph and, and be good enough to be its own own piece so there's a certain point where i kind of the photo goes away and and you know and spencer comes alive yeah yeah like like all the um all the little like abstractions and surrealisms and all those things um as i, I paint i'm getting ideas and those ideas are going into the painting and as i the more i paint and the more i do this the more of like the secret vocabulary i'm building of symbolism that um, is meaningful to me, maybe not to everyone else, but can you expand upon that? Or is that like the secret sauce? Um, let's see. Uh, uh, how do I, I guess this is audio only, obviously. So this would, might be a good time to also describe what your style is. I mean, surrealism, I guess is the best word. Yeah, I would, I mean, I've, I've in the past few years, I've, I, I've, I've given it different titles at different times like when i was using strictly script brushes a lot i i had this title for it called pinstripe impressionism um mm. um but now i see it as like slight surrealism sometimes this uh, the surrealism is always uh at different levels sometimes i like it super subtle and in in images like at some of my shirt designs, um, nobody picks up on the symbolism 
of things that are it's pretty rare that people pick up on i won't say nobody but it's kind of rare that people really analyze what's going on in my art people mm -hmm. I, at the gallery definitely people wonder um but there's definitely times when lots of the things i put in a piece no one ever notices and it's it's really bizarre um that's funny is there like a through line that that is sort of common amongst all of your pieces then as far as like um, that subtlety goes or or what that subliminal message may be? I definitely like there is definitely the the sort of like oval almond symbol which can represent an eye, a feather. Um it can represent many things. And um the eye itself, when I put an eye into a piece, that can mean so many different things personal to anybody. And, you know, part of it's like, well, it's, it's the painting staring back at the person, you know, some person maybe see it as the eye of God, or some people see it as evil, you know, like, like I've, I've gotten a lot of different reactions to some people have seen them as peacock feathers. Um, uh, it's it's real. I think I think the beauty in what I put into a piece, and then mostly shutting up about it, is I get to then experience what people see. And so what happens in that for me is the the painting becomes bigger than what I even initially intended it to be. Sure my favorite artist is david lynch and i feel like he does that really well like his movies and his photography and his paintings and, and even his music it's mysterious and you don't you don't know mm -hmm. he doesn't he may talk technicalities and he may give little clues here and there of what things mean but he doesn't he mostly almost entirely keeps his mouth shut and it just creates this world of speculation with people that are so interested in what it means, what he's, you know, uh, what it's about. And it's really crazy to hear like all, all different ideas of what people see in his art and you go, yeah, I can totally see that. And, and mm. it's, it's so fun. Like I just find that wonder uh, of art so fascinating. I was, um, when you were saying that about the eye, I just started thinking about like, I don't, is it Turkish? Like the evil eye thing, the blue and the white and the. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Or like Mediterranean. I feel like that's a very popular sort of symbol, and or like like wall ornament. And I think it's the evil eye. If I'm not mistaken, it's supposed to keep away evil, right? Isn't it sort of like a protective? Yeah, we have some bracelets in the gallery that have the evil eye on them, and I. I, I just was introduced to the evil eye through that. Um, oh, funny. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, I, I got, I got a book on, um, symbols recently and, um, I need to spend more time in it because it's, it's fascinating to hear it. I think it's always cool to, to sort of give symbols your particular meaning, but it is also really interesting to hear what certain symbols mean to people. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, you mentioned you're in Brookings in that you grew up there. Like, what did your folks do when you were growing up? Like what, I mean, Brookings is, is tiny, right? Like it's, what's the population there? It was really tiny back then. I'd say in the surrounding area, it's maybe 18,000 or so. Okay. Uh, the, the population signs still says, it says, well, city limits are like six to 7,000. Oh, wow. Uh, but it's, it's quite busy for, you know, it's, it's a pretty busy little town. When I was a kid, it was, you know, you're isolated because there was just magazines. There's magazines and barely television when I, you know, like it was rotary, I'm old, uh, there's rotary <laughs> phones and, and cable had just come to town. Right. I remember all that. And, um, yeah, I remember getting up to turn the channel on the television on the yeah. dial. Like I, re I remember doing that when I was like, you know, three or four. Yeah. And there being like maybe 12 channels. Yeah. 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 But, uh, my dad was, um, he worked at the, um, plywood mill and then my mom, um, she was a real estate agent and, uh, and, um, they, 
um, my mom did quite well for many decades at that, you know, and, um, yeah. And then, so, and then, uh, my dad was also an artist. So that's, that's kind of where I, I probably got an early start with art. Describe your gallery because it's, it's right in the thick of things, right? Obviously. And you said, what was it? Eight, eight years ago that you opened it? Yeah. Yeah. And you only felt comfortable financially five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I still, I mean, I still feel like, um, I still feel at times I, you know, I feel like everything, you know, cause sometimes you want to buy something big right. or just like this year, my finances got so low this year because I did a storefront remodel and that was so expensive. Right. That, that took all the money I had in the bank. Wow. Um, so my finances got really low this time of year. So it always kind of feels like the, the, you know, the business is at risk, um, has been at risk many times, sort of, sort of, I, I own the building. So, Oh, cool. Yeah. I own the building. So, um, I have that security, but, um, what was your question? I forgot what your question was. Well, just, I don't know. I, I, I don't even remember myself to be, to be blunt, but like, it's, uh, I I was just kind of curious about like what it was like to, to open up a store actually. And like, Oh, you know, you have your storefront now. What was, how did it come about? And now that you said that you own the building, I guess you just found a building that was for sale and you're like, Oh sweet. That would be perfect for a gallery. Or like, what was that? Well, when I was a kid, I would see businesses come and go in Brookings all the time. So I never had any plan to, or dream to build or open a business in Brookings. Mm -hmm. When I moved back about 15 years ago, um, uh, I started seeing restaurants stay open. Um, and I, I used to go, well, I still go to this place called the oxen free and they have a happy hour over there and it's across the street from the, where my gallery is. And I would just look at that building sitting vacant and just kind of dream. And one day I put a note in the door cause I didn't, you know, no one was that building had been empty for like two years and it was really run down. And one day I just put a note in the door and the owner eventually got in touch with me and she was an older woman. I, her husband had bought a bunch of properties in town and, and, um, she was managing them, but she was getting old. So, yeah. So, so she wasn't really managing them well, I'd say. And, and, uh, I met with her, the place was a wreck. It smelled. Um, and she wanted, she wanted me, uh, she, she, we were, we we're looking to rent it from her and she's, she wanted to keep the, everything the same, the, the look inside, she was proud of how it looked inside and mm. it was, it was pretty bad. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and she wanted to keep the 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 name which was banana belt gifts and i just i was i was just like i let go of the idea of opening a gallery there because i wasn't going to let my idea succeed or fail based on the look of the building and someone else's name and all that stuff right i let it go but then my mom being a real estate agent found someone that would give me a private loan. And, um, so we ended up buying it completely gutting it, opening up the ceiling there. There's this, like it had this drop ceiling that was horrendous. And then we opened it up and there's these beautiful rafters and, yeah, you know, it, and just all we had to do is dust that off, but we had to tear out everything. We had to tear out flooring and sheetrock. It was just all bad and just kind of like go down to the bones and then, and then re sheet rock. And then I had this vision for plywood on the front and back walls from the mill down the street. You know, I thought that was kind of a cool local, um, um, part to, to the actual look of the gallery as sure. well as the front desk, it, the front desk and the windows are made from the old two by fours that, I pulled from the drop ceiling, you know, so there are these kind of beautiful two by fours that, you know, um, and 
yeah, it, it was just really simple at first. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't have any experience at interior design, but I just kept my ideas simple enough that, that, um, that basically the space itself was going to be the sort of like minimalist neutral space. And then my art being so colorful and loud would need that contrast. And that, I think that's, what's been, uh, that's, that's been really good. That was a good, good idea. <laughs> yeah, totally. Cause there's no competition, right? Like it stands on its own and does the speaking for itself as opposed to like trying to compete with like some over-designed space, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And most of the shops in town, um, they have nice things, but they're kind of cluttered. Mm -hmm. Um, we're kind of one of the first shops that maybe thought about the aesthetic. And so people like to come into this. I'm sure somebody would probably get upset with me saying that, but, <laughs> but that, but that, you know, they're definitely like, like some of the businesses are very cluttered. I, I don't, I don't quite have, I, I know some shop owners, and they kind of think about that. They think about merchandise a lot differently than I do. Right. I'm not necessarily trying to, um, I'm not trying, uh, like, I'm not trying to like have sales all the time and just move stuff in and out. I'm, I'm looking for quality stuff made by small businesses um, that fits sort of the theme of the gallery. And um, I'm, I don't make a lot of money at what I do, but I, feel very good about what I do. That's cool. How do you mitigate stress? Or do, do you ever feel, I mean, like you said, financially, it's like, and again, I can identify, it's like a yo-yo, you know, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. What do you do? Like, do you have hobbies outside of painting or like, you, you mentioned happy hour. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> I still love happy hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, the older I get the I got to not participate in it, uh, as much, but, um, I, you know, I, for years I've been meditating and, um, cool. I've had a lot of stress in the past four years of my life that kind of got me away from it. And, hmm. um, um, I've been, um, getting back into it for the necessity. I need it. I need it. Like, uh, uh, I've, I've tried a lot of different things and meditation is like the best thing, uh, I've ever done and exercise and diet, you know, and all those things I go up and down on like a yo-yo, like you're saying, like I, sure. like yeah. some, cause I love bad food. Same. I love good food. I love to be lazy and I love to actually, so I, I, I can easily be lazy. I, I mean, I'm never lazy in that I'm always doing something, but I'm, I'm I, like my physical, physical fitness. When I went to art school, out of my friends, I was probably the most fit and outdoorsy and I can, but I really enjoyed those guys were so dedicated to just doing what they do and not caring about exercise and all that stuff. Oh, right. Sure. Sure. Just like head down working. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not really a healthy way to be. Um, but, but I can totally like sit around, play records, uh, um, paint, draw, um, whatever, you know, like I, yeah. I, it's so easy for me to, to not exercise. And so I have to really try. Well, tell me more about the meditation practice. Is it a specific time of day? Is it a duration or does it vary or I do it for, I try to fit it in 20 minutes in the morning. And, um, the goal for me with meditation is just purely to, um, any thoughts that, come in my head I just try to um uh let them go right and that's all it is it's like like uh, it's really simple for me I, I I'm not sometimes I'll put on some um music like this morning there's this guy named Lust Mord and he has these he has this album of like chants and it has this really like hollow deep earthy sound you know that sort of almost seems like um the sounds of death and stuff so oh interesting so sometimes i'm content like i'm just like sitting in the idea of the afterlife or um uh i'm just trying to sit in an empty place right um and let 
anxiety, thoughts, to do's, everything pass by me. And I think from what I've, ex what I can express the way that benefits me is in life. I take that away and I'm, I maybe won't, I'll maybe take a second to, before I react to people in a bad way, mm -hmm. it's sort of killed any sort of road rage or any, you know, like any rage I, I get, you know, I have a fire in me and, and I, I need to, I need to kind of, um, quench, quench it with meditation, I think, you know? So is that deep sound that he produces, is that like with a synthesizer or like, what is he using instrumentally? Do you know? Uh, it's like chants. It's different people chanting. I'm not. Oh, so it's vocal. Some of it's vocal, but there's definitely like these deep resonant sounds that, Whoa. that I'm, yeah, they must be synthesizers and stuff. I'll send you the album, but it's, um, I think it's, uh, lust more the word as power or something like that. I think that's the name of the album, but it's, I hadn't listened to it in a long time. And I, um, this morning I put it on again and just put on my headphones and 20 minutes just flew right by. Wow. It's almost like I entered a different place and, and yeah, my goal, I had a lot of thoughts in my head this morning and the, the, when I, when I, when I'm not meditating, the thoughts can sort of own my headspace. Oh, of course. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's not healthy for me at times, you know, do you have a, do you have like a common story that you're telling yourself or is it kind of like a, does that make sense? Uh, of the stuff that fills my head? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or is it very day to day? It's, it's a lot. It's, it's just like, it's, uh, you know, I definitely have struggled with depression and stuff. So it's, it's, you know, it's like maybe it's past actions. Uh, mm. Um, it could be, it could be, it's, it's, I don't know. It's weird. It's my, my thoughts can just attack me at times. Yeah. Um, they even, even to the extent that like it can sort of cripple, um, me wanting to be creative and that's a really bad thing for me sure. because so what I've done to combat that is be creative every day when the voice when it, it's not like an audible voice, but what I mean by the voices is when, when those voices in my head tell me I can't do it. Um, and then I don't do it. They're winning. They're right. Yeah. If I, if I say I'm going to create every day, or at least I'm going to strive to get things done to open space to create, yeah. then that's, that's, I'm, I'm my happiness. I'm, I'm my happiest when I'm creating. I think um, there's a few things there that I would love to talk about, but like, first of all, like I heard this expression not long ago and it was, um, you know, anxiety lives in the future and depression lives in the past. And um, so that's why it's kind of important to be kind of present and in, in the now so that you can kind of avoid both of those lanes. Um, and the other thing I heard recently, which I then put on my calendar every day because um, sometimes I, sh I love to exercise. Like I am very active historically, but now I'm just so bogged down with work that I, oftentimes I just don't have the energy to exercise because obviously it takes physical energy to do so. So then on my calendar, I wrote discipline, not motivation, because you shouldn't be motivated to work out. You should just be doing it. You know, and I think that's sort of like your act of painting, it sounds like. You're disciplined to create whether you want to or not. Now, the cool thing about both, right, you could go on a half a mile walk or a 10 mile walk, or you could do eight minutes of painting or eight hours of painting, you know, as long as you're doing it. And I think the discipline is really the key to getting out of ruts and to maintaining sort of your sanity in the present as well, you know, just because it's like, you don't have a choice, you're doing it, right? So it's a yeah, whether, yeah. however you feel about it, you're going to do it. Totally. Yeah. It's that's funny. That's so important. Yeah. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned the word fire being inside of you because like, I look at a lot of your waves crashing in your photos and they almost look like flames of a fire that are kind of rising from the water up. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, 
more specifically, the one behind you, like even the colors used, it looks like a freaking fire. I know. And I guess that's because it's a sunset or, well, I guess it'd be a sunrise if it's a West Coast painting, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I th I'd say the way that, that yeah, the lights. The, it, this is the uh, the the so the lady wanted me to paint from this of a it's a it's a photo her husband had taken. Um, it does look like morning light. Um, uh, he's he was a fan of my art and he died and she wanted me mm -hmm. to make a painting uh, um, from one of his photos. Well, man, that's it's fascinating that you just showed me the type of photo that you can paint from because your use of color is so insane in such a beautiful way that like the the fact that you're painting from a black and white photo, first of all, uh, that's just crazy. Like I when you reached over to show me the photo, I, I didn't in a million years predict it would have been a black a black and white photo. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And I started monochromatically with sort of like a, almost something that would look sepia. And then um, colors and things are like, I'm, I'm really at this point just relying on my intuition. I'm not necessarily planning out like atmospheric um, depth or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just merely tr um, going with my instinct on colors. Sometimes those instincts need refinement, but um, but I I do like the idea of the raw colors that want to that I feel like that are coming out of me at that moment, putting those yeah. down, and then discovering what where to go from there. It's a that's a fun like I don't know how people just kind of like paint the same thing over and over and over. Like I I'm painting oceans, but and I and I've done it my whole career, but in order for me to stay motivated to paint waves, the waves had to take on um, more meaning. You know, the, the waves had to become symbolic of something else. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different energy, which is why I love surfing, like in general, because it's like, yes, there's gravity that pulls you down a mountain when you're snowboarding, but like there's something completely different about surfing because the wave is moving and changing constantly. Yeah. And the source of where the wave came from is also different. You know, it could be a wind swell, a ground swell, a storm, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, it, that I think that's just like the most fascinating part of surfing. Mm -hmm. I also think it serves as a wonderful meditation as well, because like you can't, or at least being in the moment, because you're either looking at the wave, thinking about the wave, paddling for a wave, like you can't help but think about what you're doing in the moment. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've ever like come to the realization that like, have you ever been riding a wave and be like, not thinking about surfing? You know what I mean? Like it's impossible. Right. Right. It's, I know. Isn't that great? I mean, I guess if you're a long border and you get on one of those like 30 second point break waves, that's like, you got time then. But like, if you're a short border and like riding something pitchy, there's no way in hell you're thinking about anything other than how to stay on the wave or bail. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think we all, I think a, a, a lot of us that do surf and do sports, like maybe wakeboarding and things like that. Mm -hmm. It is, it is like a meditation of sorts to in those moments, um, you know, and it, you know, it's yeah. I, even with longboarding, uh, like I, I, cause I kind of ride everything. Cool. With, I've had to sort of change my as I'm aging. I've had to change, you know, like when I was younger, it was all about perspective mm -hmm. and then, um, uh, sorry, not perspective. It was all about, um, adrenaline. Sure. Uh, as you age, you can't, I've beat my body up enough that I can't, I can't, go for the adrenaline experiences. And then, so what's fun is like hopping on a longboard and the nuance of your turns and every, you know, like how just where you're standing on the board, just those little, like, like fine, refined refinements are just, I love that. I, you know, I love that. Yeah. It's, it's neat to like, it's, it's cool to adapt your brain to your age and, you know, cause I think a lot of people get caught in, I'm not who I was, you know, like you're talking about being in the present and not, not being, you know, not 
getting depressed about the past. It's kind of a less is more philosophy too. And your timing of mentioning this is, is, is impeccable because I just put my mountain bike up for sale <laughs> and, and it was, it's, it's literally that like, I just, I don't have the motivation to ride my mountain bike the same way I have my road bike, which clearly less is more on a road bike than it is on a mountain bike. I mean, I guess you could make the argument it is too on a mountain bike, but you have to be way more attentive on a mountain bike than you need to be on a road bike. Like road bike is, you can sort of zen out and sort of, get lost in the ride and just make sure that your, your pedal stroke is consistent. And then once that's consistent, like you just follow the road, you know what I mean? Whereas mountain biking, you're like reacting. You, all you, the time. Yeah. Complete reaction all the time, which, which has its own meditational like benefits as well. Right. Because again, you can't think about anything other than mountain biking when you're doing that, but it's the age factor and the abuse that you can take that I'm no longer interested in, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, uh, Oh, I have a hard time letting go of that. Yeah. Same. I, I ride a lot of things, but I ride a bodyboard a lot and I like to go big. Yeah. Um, I, even now I've got two hurt, two hurt shoulders. Cause I've, I've just like, I, I go for big airs and things and I, and I, my body's getting aware. It's like, you can't do as much of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I'm also a proponent of mountain biking with other people for safety concerns. You know, like I'm not a huge mountain biker, like that wants to go alone. Cause if you fall and crack your, I mean, it's so rocky here where I grew up in North Carolina and I used to race mountain bikes, like packed, hard packed dirt, smooth, flowy trails. I mean, yeah, the occasional root and rock and stuff, but here it's like a hundred percent rocks, you know? And it's like, you can't ride a mountain bike unless it's a dual suspension borderline, you know, like it's just, it's just gnarly. Like if you're really doing it the way I'd want to do it. Right. So much in the same way we have now the discipline to create every day. I'm removing the discipline of looking at my mountain bike hanging on my wall and just saying like, okay, let's just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's hard sometimes to let go of things like that, but yeah, as you get older, it's nice just... when you have things to replace it with though. Yeah, for sure. And I still have my road bike, right? So it's not like I'm anti-cycling or anything, but um, yeah, anyway, but uh, back to you. The So the other thing that's cool about you too is like your assortment has grown. Obviously, you mentioned t-shirts a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, what's sort of been your approach to like kind of what to make next? Not artistically, but just product wise, be it a postcard or a shirt or I don't know, stickers or patches or whatever. Um, I, I'm always trying to catch up with that. I, there's so much more I want to make. I haven't mm. made patches. We got a button maker not long. I mean like a year ago and we still haven't really produced any buttons. I, I have a laser now so I can do all kinds of lasering stuff. And then I recently I was looking at, um, something called a UV printer and, um, the possibilities of that look pretty cool, but, cool. um, I'm just, I, I think as far as making product, I'm just always, first off, I'm just trying to fill what sells well, which is like hats and now it's, now it's clothing as well. Mm. And I have a, I have a jewelry maker that makes jewelry with my art on it. And I'm, I'm, Ooh. there's just so many, it's so cool now. Cause there's so many like options of good quality items um uh with that i can put my art on you know like yesterday i was working on another enamel mug um i like those little camping mugs so yeah i'm just always trying to uh i don't know i'm i'm a, i've got a lot of ideas it, part of its budget um you know having the money to to sink into products and um time and budget really is is oh. and sometimes i'm just i'm i i don't necessarily work like by a yearly schedule it'd probably be good if i did if you know if i started going i'm i sort of am i'm, I'm sort of like i want three t-shirt designs for next summer so 
and then that will add to the collection that I already have. And I, and I'm trying to get to where I can just sort of produce as many of the designs I've already made because they all sell still. So, um, um, so I'm a little bit different than a clothing company like that, where they, um, uh, they have their season there's ha they have a shirt for a season and then they move on i i reprint a lot of things because um i'm not big enough right you know i can do that because there's always new people coming in the shop yeah i was going to say the tourism probably lends itself best to that because it's always somebody new who's coming into the store for the first time and yeah um here's a question i meant to ask earlier how do you decide what size to paint meaning like the canvas or whatever? Um, uh, you know, I, I try to go, um, around about, you know, something bigger than a 16 by 20, because at least for my studio stuff, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't know what this is, but this is basically like half a door. Like this is a hollow core door. Oh, okay. Um, so it's usually something the width of a door. Um, uh, and I do a certain size for the studio stuff because if I do, I charge a certain amount per square inch for a painting. If I do a small painting, I can still spend a lot, like too much time on it and not get very much for the original. Not as I much see. as the time is worth. So I paint a little bit larger to get a, um, it's easier to paint larger. It looks better and it, you know, I'd rather sell a larger painting than a smaller painting. Sure. That's cool. What was your first car? Uh, uh, it was a really nice, um, Volkswagen, uh, super beetle, 1974 super beetle. Oh, sick. What color? It was uh charcoal gray with centerline rims. What was the interior? It was, it was like a gray velour. Oh, whoa. It was too nice for, um, I got it for like, 3,500. Um, but it was too nice for, um, a guy just turning 16. Like I Which, shouldn't have had that car. Well, how did it come into your life? Like what, tell me, how'd you get it? The neighbor down the street. Okay. Um, I, I, my, I think my dad really wanted me to have it and, um, he really liked it and he saw it for, was for sale and, and I, I obviously loved it, but um, I snuck it out of the, I, like when my parents would go out of town, I, I snuck it out before I had a driver's license and oh, sweet. driving with your friends. But then my parents come back in town and they're like, my dad's like, did you drive the car? And I'm like, no. And he's, and why is there only a quarter of a tank of fuel in it? <laughs> uh, so the way that the muffler connected to the other pipe was just this thin little bracket and and just bumping that muffler would always undo the bracket and so i think he started it up and it was way louder than it should be and which is clearly i'd been driving you hit you hit a pothole or six yeah 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 speed bump or something and with a with a carload of you know kids that you know i was i was 15 they were 15 like we we're just like that's awesome yeah so what happened to the car I had it for a few years and I, you know, I was a, I was a crusty surfer kid. I didn't keep it as nice. I mean, it was, I had it for a few years and then we sold it and I, and I got a, a little Mazda truck from my dad. He was getting something better and I got a little Mazda truck and that fit me way better. Sure. Just throw my surf through your boards. Board. Yeah. 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 What's the daily driver now? I know you mentioned the element in your early like traveling days or are you still, you still have an element? No, I have a, a Ford Transit passenger van I got um, uh, five or six years ago. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's a big bread box of a vehicle. It's not a it's not super tall. It's just it's just a you know kind of normal height. Mm -hmm. It's a pain to park. Um, takes up a whole parking space, but it's nice to have the space. And I don't I don't drive a lot, so um, it's. It's not the most fuel efficient car, but I don't drive that much. So, uh, you right. know, a tank of gas will last me two or three weeks. So you live close to the studio or the, the, the store? Yeah, everything. I mean, you know, all commerce and stuff in Brookings is five to 10 minutes away from you everywhere right. you, in every direction. Yeah. 
So I guess remind me, because I didn't really notice when I was there in July, is your studio that you paint in on the premises or do you paint at home? Currently I'm painting at home. Um, okay. I just moved into a new house with my girlfriend and um, cool. Uh, currently I'm painting at home. I was painting in the studio for um, a time. It's really nice to paint in the studio at night. I can close some curtains and the lighting's beautiful in there. Oh, sweet. I haven't done it recently. Um, it's nice also to like my record players right there. So it's nice to put on records and, and, uh, or podcasts and paint. I really enjoy that. And, you know, just at night you create this nice day or night, but you know, particularly at night, you just create, you know, maybe you make yourself a martini or something and, and, uh, um, uh, play some music and paint. And I just, I just, I love it. So I don't, I don't, I barely watch television. Yeah. I mostly just, you know, do, there's just so much fun stuff to do. Like I, I have a lot of friends that are into all the television shows and I'm like, I just don't have the time. I, I have <laughs> yeah. no interest. Like I have no interest. Like my, like I can't imagine just spending, I, I could watch a good movie, but right. I like the idea that I can, I could watch a movie and I'm done. I don't want to, you know, be on a long journey with the television show. I'm, um, I'm the exact same way. I can't, I, I just, I feel worse about myself if I sit on a sofa and watch television. I just, YouTube's different. I do watch a lot of YouTube because, and it's not like an ADD thing because, oh, these videos are shorter, but it's just content that I know I'm want. I guess I just always want to learn, you know what I mean? And YouTube is a very good resource for that, you know? Yeah. And you can listen and, and not watch too. I totally. like that. Yeah. This podcast exists on YouTube with a static image. So to your point, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I've been meaning to check your out, podcast out. I haven't had a chance yet, but... Oh, it's all good. Yeah, stress-free, man. Um, you're wearing a Ween t-shirt that I would almost argue that you could have designed. <laughs> I know. Uh, what What's on the record player right now? What record's over there? Uh, I was listening to... The last one I was listening to last night was um, Hanson Brothers, which is... Um, do you know? Do you know No Means No? Uh, vaguely it sounds familiar they're a canadian um they're a canadian punk rock band they're not they're not together anymore i was a huge fan of no means no and um when i was living in seattle i'd go see them a lot and if i remember right no means no would cross the country as no means no and then they'd come back as the hansen brothers which was sort of a ramones-esque hockey it's puck rock yeah, I was going to say, is it like angry delivery, but nice messaging because they're Canadian? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of that. There's there's heartbreak. There's there's talks of uh, Zambonis and things. But um, but it's but yeah, it's puck rock. It's it's uh, it's it like they were big Ramones fans. So it's, it, you know, they'll even start songs out with a one, two, three, four, you know. Right, right, right. I hadn't listened to the album in a long time. And so I put it on last night and I was like, oh man, this reminds me of Seattle in the 90s. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So sweet, man. Well, before we exit, share where people can, you know, check you out and like find your work and stuff. Um, My Instagram. Gosh, I don't even know what it is. I think it's Spencer Reynolds artist. I think that's right. Yeah, I have Spencer Reynolds artist. I have an account called Absurdamental on Instagram too. That is, uh, I don't, I don't have a lot of time to invest in, but it's more of like my really raw stuff and things that maybe don't fit quite as well in in the um, in my regular account. Sure. I have the semi-aquatic gallery Instagram. My website is artandsurf.com. And uh, that's mainly it. Sweet. Awesome, man. Some, a few other social media things, but I, I'm, I'm not consistent enough with social media. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I found out about your store opening, like, I think it was Facebook. But I mean, again, this is eight years ago or whatever. Yeah, I still do so, Facebook, but it's yeah. that, you know, I don't... I'm a post and ghost type of guy. I, I'm, I've never heard that expression. That's 
That's exactly how I am on Facebook. But usually it's, I'm posting to Instagram and it doubles. It'll just automatically post to Facebook, I think. Yeah. And it's like people will like, and then I'll go on to Facebook after a week of not being on it and being like, oh shoot, I wasn't ignoring these people. It's just, I'm never, you know, <laughs> so, but anyway, Spencer, great to see you, man. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a big fan and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. And uh, yeah, I'm stoked to to share your work with, with the listeners and such. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I'll be in touch. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Cool. See ya. This wraps up this episode of the Standard Age Podcast. If you like what you heard, I'd love it if you'd share it with a friend or two. And if you have a moment, please rate and review the show as it helps others discover these episodes. It absolutely helps far more than you realize. Shout out to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.